One year ago, our country was uh, forced to fight a pandemic, a new virus that uh, was all uncertain. Our government implemented its pandemic plan and uh, it, it created the Interagency Task Force for Emerging Infectious Diseases to manage this global problem. Almost a year ago now, we are experiencing our second surge. And again, we are struggling as we fight this particular pandemic and all the uncertainty that goes with it. Today, in health issues, we will tackle the two most important balancing acts that our government, the IATF, and our officials have been trying to do since last year. The balance between health and economics. Our guest for today is Professor Emeritus of the UP School of Economics, Professor Ernesto Perna, former Director General and Secretary of the National Economic and Development Authority. Good morning, Secretary Perna, and thank you for joining us in Health Issues. Good morning, uh, EVP uh, Ted Erbosa. Uh, highly uh, respected and uh, famous. <laughs> thank you very much, Secretary Perna. Yeah. Last year, around this time, uh, you decided to go back to the academe and the private sector after the several hours of debates, probably in the IATF, I can imagine. And uh, the first question I would ask you as an economist, as a, as a famous economist, and, sir, I read your papers when I was under Secretary of Health. We did a lot of papers on health and development <laughs> and economics. And it was also our uh, papers for basis for implementing universal health coverage. <laughs> sir, have you ever experienced anything like the effects of this pandemic to our Philippine economy in the past? Oh, well, uh, not uh, in my memory. Uh, I think this pandemic is uh, without uh, precedent or precedent. And uh, I think it's, uh, no, most uh, Filipinos would not have it, uh, would have, would not have had any other experience that is worse than this pandemic. I mean, uh, many Filipinos, uh, those born uh, or the baby boomers or those born during the war would not uh, have experienced this kind of thing. That's correct. Actually, uh, experiences of economic troubles, I just heard a stories in the dining table from my parents who lived through World War II. Yes. Correct. So when we were discussing before, uh, I asked you before why you decided to walk back to the university. I said, uh, what are the reasons? And you mentioned to me that it was about philosophical and developmental differences with the strategy that was what's going. I think a year on now, I think you'll be more than willing because I think we were proven sure, right. Sure, sure. So can you explain uh, well, me and define what does what yeah. the philosophical economic development differences were? Uh, to be to be happy in government work, you have to be in uh, a friendly, convivial, and uh, you know, so smooth uh, rapport with uh, other members uh, of the economic team because that was uh, where I had to do most of my work. I had to work with the members of the economic team, and uh, you know, uh, in the economic team. Uh, uh, other people are finance uh, people or budget people like uh, uh, Avisado and uh, Dominguez is a more a finance person and I was the economist and you know there's a big there's quite a difference between uh, a finance uh, person and an economist because an economist uh, looks at the big picture and uh, Whereas uh, the finance person looks at uh, just the financial aspects of a project or any undertaking. And uh, for example, uh, in the case of the uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, my preference and you know, what I was trying to push was we should have started uh, Big Bang in terms of spending so that we could... Uh, ramp up or really uh, rapidly enhance our health system capacity in terms of uh, social infrastructure, hospitals, testing centers, and so on, as well as our human capital, our healthcare workers. 
uh, this is what our Asian neighbors did. They, they, they had a big bang approach, meaning they tried to nip uh, the bud at the very beginning of the pandemic. And that is why they came out much better in a much better situation now than we are. You know, uh, many people uh, in this uh, uh, second surge or second wave of the pandemic, they say that all oh, uh, everything, uh, you know, these surges are also happening in other parts of the world. No, we should not compare ourselves with other parts of the world, especially the European and uh, Western countries, because uh, they're different. We should be comparing ourselves with our Asian neighbors. And if we look around at, in our Asian neighborhood, there are no problems they're encountering now that what, uh, like what we're encountering. And th that is because they really uh, you know, addressed, they uh, came to grips with the pandemic very early. And that is why, you know, if you look at the spending uh, uh, pattern uh, for a COVID response among Asian countries, uh, we have the lowest uh, numbers in terms of total COVID spending, uh, COVID response spending uh, uh, in proportion to uh, as a fraction of GDP, we have the lowest, and also in terms of uh, per capita spending, meaning as you know, this spending uh, per per person. So that is why we ha we have you know we have been really uh, uh, hobbled by this uh, pandemic. And, uh, you know, in the case of the other countries, what they did was they ramp up uh, health system capacity right away. Mm -hmm. For example, Vietnam had uh, very few hospitals, but in a matter of a month, they were able to generate so many hospitals, not, uh, you know, first class hospitals, but hospitals that are makeshift hospitals or modular hospitals uh, to, to be able to handle the, the, the cases that uh, came up. And the same thing with the other countries. And uh, that is why, uh, you know, how many deaths was in Vietnam? Some, I think only two deaths in Vietnam, five deaths in Thailand, and uh, maybe Malaysia, uh, uh, single digit, and not even, uh, not, not even double digit. And Indonesia is, uh, you know, a little bit uh, closer to our problem, but also Indonesia has handled, given a huge population and a huge territory, uh, Indonesia has also done quite well compared with us. So the thing is, uh, we have a large population, the highest poverty incidence among Asian countries, the highest inequality. So the more reason we should really have uh, done a big bang approach to the COVID as early as February, or even, even maybe even March, because we really started March already, but they started uh, February these other countries. Correct. And as I said, big bang approach. At then, uh, we were spending in, dri in dribs and drabs, mm -hmm. on on over time. And that is why you can see, you know, th th there are data on this, uh, from, which have been uh, monitored by the ADB uh, over time. And, uh, you know, they show that uh, the Philippines really has been, uh, you know, rather conservative in approaching the COVID uh, pandemic in terms of spending, uh, spending to enhance, uh, to enhance the health system capacity, improve our, the uh, remuneration of our healthcare workers so, they, so that they don't leave. They would, many would have stayed behind if right. uh, their remuneration were more, uh, you know, uh, decent. Correct. And, uh, and uh, so then, you know, instead of uh, too much lockdown, we should have done testing, tracing, I don't know, isolation and treatment, and then uh, do uh, selective targeted lockdowns. That is what the other Asian countries did. Not, uh, you know, not uh, uh, kind of uh, umbrella lockdown, which really cripples the economy. Health is economy because Health and economy are inextricably linked. There is no trade-off between health and the economy. Whatever you spend for health is going to benefit the economy. Why? Because uh, you spend on testing and tracing and all that, 
and, uh, and improving your host social in infrastructure, hospitals, and other health centers, then that also provides a stimulus to the economy. At the same time, uh, you know, when the health system capacity is improved, then uh, workers are more healthy, they are more productive, so it's better for the economy. Yun ang ano eh. It's a symbiotic relationship between, between the economy, between health and the economy. Uh, I, I cannot uh, argue with that. In fact, when I listen to you, that's exactly how I feel when I talk to a financial person who looks at healthcare as a cost and a budget person who looks at healthcare as an expenditure. But when, you, you, when you're talking to me, you're saying health is actually an investment. We should yes. invest in the health system because it will be good for the economy. And I, I cannot argue with that. that. That to me as a, as a health systems person, I can understand that very clearly. So there were difficulties with this. They eventually implemented everything you said, but they were not nimble and fast about yes. it because they ramped up hospitals. They ramped up. They spent for PPEs, equipment to... Uh, uh, remuneration for doctors and nurses. They also uh, ramped up testing. But I think we were very slow. Uh, yes. uh, how could we have speeded this up? Should it, is it our bureaucracy? Is it problems in procurement? Is it our, the way we respond to an emergency? Uh, what are your views on the speed okay. which we eventually implemented the response? Now, I have, I have noticed that... Uh, you know, from budgeting to, uh, no, no, from, yeah, from, from budgeting to, uh, you know, uh, uh, budgeting and then uh, disbursement and then spend, spending, there are too many lags. Matagal mm -hmm. ang ano eh. Yes. Matagal ang lags. Uh, uh, notice that, uh, you know, the, the spending, uh, the ayuda for the first week of the lockdown had not been uh, <laughs> distributed. It's only in the second week now. So there, there is a one week lag for an ayuda. This, that is uh, really a matter of life and death for many. For sure, many the ayuda people. is only, the one given is the guidance only. The That's money not, hasn't got to the right. LGBT yet. I think it's going to be delivered today only. The yeah. money. So budgeting, obligating, uh, uh, disbursement, and then spending. My mga lag siya eh. I don't know why it, it, it is that like that. And then, you know, I, I, I know you're familiar with the IATF, uh, Dr. Ted. Yes. And uh, I, uh, you know, I was also part of that before I uh, stepped down. And uh, I really think uh, the IATF should have been a combination of government and the private sector. Because right. there are many experts in the private sector, not only medical uh, doctors, but also scientists. Correct. Should have been or should be in the uh, IATF instead of too many, too many from government and, and mo program. most of them military. So that, that, is, that is another thing that uh, we could have, uh, no, we could have, uh, you know, modified over time because it's clear that uh, we need expertise in science, in medicine, not uh, in terms of lockdowns. That's so, actually correct, no? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm an emergency, my field is disaster medicine and emergency medicine. Oh. And I study these things and I say, you know, it's not about whether you did the response or not. It's the one who did an early or late response. Yes. So as you clearly stated, we were not very nimble in the way we responded compared to our neighbors like Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Vietnam even, and Malaysia. So they responded quickly. And we responded. We also did the same things that they did, but we didn't do it as fast as they did. I think that's really the, the, the way you have to be ahead of the pandemic, of the virus, rather than be following it. And yeah. responding. Anticipatory and foresight planning is what's needed. And, and uh, also virtuous impatience, sense that's of urgency. Yeah. Sense of urgency is it very important. That's emergency, that's emergency, and uh, you know, and sometimes uh, in emergency we take risks uh, because of our impatience. I will not go check the book on what to do on a person who is crashing in front of me in the emergency room. I'll have to do what I can immediately, yeah. given yeah. the medicine I know to treat him to yeah. save his life. 
So my my concept of a pandemic is the same. A pandemic is just a population, and you're yeah. treating it with an infection, and you need to respond fast, or else you'll be left behind. So what what solutions or what were the things that you think should change after? After this, we will review this whole pandemic uh, thing. I've learned so many things being part of the National Task Force, which the IATF formed. But the, I have so many ideas on how pandemic response of a government should happen. And you mentioned one of them, the partnership with the private sector. Yes. That's yes. very important. Any other ideas? Yeah, and, and remember that the private sector, they were quite uh, nimble and very quick in responding uh, at the start of the pandemic. They provide a lot of, uh, you know, consumables as well as, uh, you know, uh, necessities like uh, PTEs. And they also provided, you know, uh, even quarantine facilities. Yes. So, you know, they're willing to... to workers. They donated yeah, food. Yeah. They're willing to cooperate. Kailangan lang na yung government should have a friendly relationship with the private sector. May pagka, ano, a bit, a bit of uh, adversarial, ano eh. Ang, ano, ang, ang uh, relationship between the government. And, you know, I noticed that, that ano, eh. for example, uh, the way, uh, you know, uh, ABS-CBN was shut down was really, you know, I, I thought that was, a, you know, kind of uh, counterproductive. And that... also and also the way uh, uh, yung Manila Water and Manila were... Uh, Ice their contract. Uh, Nasten. Or, yeah, or, yeah. Hindi naman na di man di man fault hindi naman fault na yun ang ano ng uh, private sector proponents uh, they happened then in two previous administrations and at that time it was necessary the, the, the kind of you know, very liberal uh, concession agreement to these uh, private sector proponents uh, for water was needed because we were really in in dire straits so you know. But, but you know, I, I, I was really every, every time that happened in cabinet meetings. I, this is just between us. I was really feeling very uneasy, and you know, I kind of uh, you know thought that uh, we are just uh, you know we are in, instead of encouraging the private sector, we are dissuading them. We are also, uh, we are yeah we are you know ostracizing the private sector, which is which is uh, wrong because. Uh, Alamo, uh, GDP, GDP. If you if you break down GDP, seventy five per seventy five percent is accounted for by the private sector, businesses, and the households. Right. Only only twenty to twenty five percent is uh, contributed by the government in terms of GDP. Yeah? so talagang ang, ang the engine of economic growth is the private sector, and the government is supposed to be providing the enabling policy environment yun ang ano yun ang uh, yun ang mindset ng uh, economist eh, which so is different. you mentioned two things no, no the yeah. private sector and you mentioned in the private sector one very important thing that we in the disaster world look to in times of a pandemic i've been taught that the way to fight a pandemic is through a command structure collaboration which is the partnership with the pri private sector and the third part they tell me the third c is communication. Yes. To shut down a major a mainstream media outlet in the middle of a pandemic that communicates with the people yeah. it have been uh, too much, right? Yes. It's made yes. it quite too much and it yeah. affected the way we communicate to people. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, it's really bad timing. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this was uh, the uh, sole uh, source of uh, news and information for the, for the poorer segments of the population in the out, outlying areas in the provinces so talagang ano i mean uh, parang it was anti poor rather than pro poor uh, no, decision there was, there was another thing that i noticed during the pandemic is that the countries that actually responded very well had a head start because if you remember in 2012 after the, or even earlier in 2009 when we had the SARS, countries around us like Vietnam, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore were all severely affected by SARS. Yes. And then they, they, they were followed with this avian influenza. So they actually had a lot of systems development that we didn't see. And because our country didn't get the avian influenza early on, 
we only had one case of SARS, we never invested in the health systems that these guys started to kick in. That's why they responded nimbly because they had a head start. What do you think of this? Yes, uh, I, I agree. Uh, that is, that is uh, related to what I said about the Big Bang approach at the start of the pandemic. As early as February, uh, they already you know, decided to, uh, to spend Big Bang rather than little bits and pieces over time, which, uh, which, which, which is what we did. So, uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a repetition of, uh, of you know, and we have severely underinvested in our health system capacity, in our health infrastructure. And, uh, you know, we have about, the, the data across Asian countries, we have about nine per 10,000 population, nine beds, hospital beds per 10,000 population, Vietnam has 17. Correct. Uh, Malaysia has, uh, yeah, they have even much higher hospital beds per 10,000 population. So, talagang na iwanan tayo dito. And yes, instead of, uh, you know, I, I agree with the build, 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 you know, physical infrastructure projects, but then we have neglected the social infrastructure projects, yes. which, uh, which cover hospitals. And that is why we're having this, uh, you know. And now, I, I noticed that uh, with this uh, second wave, uh, we are now uh, you know, putting up modular hospitals, Correct. makeshift hospitals. We should have done that before. Beginning. China <laughs> built a 1,000-bed hospital. That's hey, uh, Secretary Pernia, do you know that I wrote Secretary Duque as Executive yeah. Vice President of UP in March? And I have that letter. I was asking him to already build PGH Diliman, which uh -huh. was a also remember for a 700 yes, bed. Yes, yes, yes. I told her, I told in the letter, I said in the letter, it is time to build this facility. If we cannot build it, let's get our Chinese counterparts to help us build a 700 bed facility in two weeks. Yes. Yeah. But I never got a reply. <laughs> the other thing you've explained is about the economic effects of the pandemic. And we did the lockdown approach, which was good in saving lives because our mortality was low. Oh. I just discovered after implementing this, that's why our economy went down, is people told me that the whole GDP of the Philippines was actually, I think 25% of it is NCR. Another large percentage was Calabar Zone and Region 3. And then uh, Cebu and uh, Davao follow, uh, you know, contribute a little more. So the place where we implemented the lockdown, ground zero of this pandemic, is really the economic hub. And we stopped economic growth at that time. No, no actually, NCR, uh, Dr. Ted, is, uh, accounts for 35% of oh, GDP. Even higher. And then uh, Calabarzon, Calabarzon, around 19% uh, of GDP. That's fifty percent already of our GDP. Yeah, and then uh, Central Luzon, uh, around uh, fifteen percent. So uh, Cal uh, NCR, Calabarzon, and uh, Central Luzon they account for two thirds, two thirds of GDP, sixty three percent to be exact of GDP. So malaki, malaki talaga ang ano. Stop economic activities in an area. This was never realized by even my colleague doctors. My colleague doctors who say, who says, life first before we can rebuild the economics, doesn't realize the major impact of a strict uh, community quarantine or a lockdown policy to fight a pandemic. Yeah. You know, if, if we, had, uh, we had this, uh, you know, more uh, agile uh, and modern uh, testing, tracing, isolation, treatment, like Korea, for example, and the other Asian countries, uh, uh, in, in but, uh, parang, ano, parang they were using ano na, parang, uh, technology. They use digital. Yeah, they, they use technology. No? They use technology. So with that kind of uh, approach to testing, tracing, etc., there's no need to have uh, no, a big lockdown. Eh? Because uh, no, parang, uh, you are able to to isolate uh, the problem instead of uh, you know uh, getting everybody to be uh, under a lockdown and uh, then the economy uh, workers are not able to you know to work and uh, get uh, their life support uh, in terms of their incomes so that 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 i think is uh, well there's there's another thing in in what you've been discussing with me this morning is the fact that 
the hub of economic activity seems to have concentrated on a very small land area in the Philippines, which is the national capital region. And yes. I'm actually surprised to see, see that we're now considered one of the highest population densities for land space. I heard we have overtaken DACA in terms of the number of people. So it seems that all economic activity of people from the provinces will all go to Manila. You want to start a business, you start it at NCR. So would you, as an economic planner, think that one of the things we need to do to fight a future pandemic is to decongest megacities like NCR? Oh, like yeah, NCR. yes. I, I think and, uh, we should have done that a long time ago. We should have really, uh, you know, we should really have animated our uh, regional centers like uh, Cebu, uh, uh, Iloilo, uh, so that ma, no, ma, the, the, the congestion is uh, distributed across, across the country. And it's also better for, uh, for you know, for... Uh, for risk management, because... If for risk management and also for uh, reducing inequality. Okay, okay. Because uh, it's too concentrated in Manila, so the rest are really lagging behind uh, too much. Uh, yes, I think our problem, uh, Dr. Ted, is that our uh, initial, what we call uh, initial conditions, is that we have a large population, we have a very, we have very dense, uh, you know, national capital region, and other Cebu is also uh, quite dense, huh? and mm -hmm. therefore. Uh, with a large population that is densely uh, settled in in a limited uh, territory like Metro Manila and uh, Cebu and maybe Davao and other congested cities, uh, you have a high poverty incidence, high inequality. So it's very difficult for you to. It's very difficult for people living in informal settlements. To be physical distancing, how can how can you how can you have physical distancing when uh, you know there are ten people in a small room? And also the other thing is and to, go to work, uh, how, you have to ride a bus that is full. Uh, that's right. And also, how can you do a frequent hand washing? There's no water. <laughs> There's no tapo, water in there. Tapo. <laughs> tapo, tapo. 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 <laughs> they, they have to save water not, but they can brush their teeth. So. Right. Hindi talagang mahirap yung ano yung uh, physical distancing and then hand washing and maybe even ano yung yung mga uh, masks they have to be washed uh, every day to be to be usable the following day but that cannot be done um, for many you know for many in the uh, informal uh, settlements Professor Pernia, you're going to another part of economics, which is your, your expertise, which is demographics. Um, you know, we're going into where people, I mean, the politicians let this happen. They will not remove the informal settlers. They will not resettle them and use them as power voting blocks <laughs> during times uh, of election. And we're having elections again next year. Yeah. So I'm very sure in the next few months, no informal settler will be removed out of their location. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's uh, what you call it. It's a uh, incentive compatible for incentive uh, compatible. For, for politicians. <laughs> I love your paradox yeah. statement. Incentive compatible, compatible for politicians. No, there's no incentive for them to uh, no. In fact, there's no incentive for them to to uh, you know to encourage. Uh, uh, their population to practice family planning because the more the more people there are in their district the better for them in terms of dynasty i've in had terms. i've had mayors that fought with our reproductive health law they will that's not right. That's right. At all. yeah alamo you know if we had followed the uh, well we, we started ahead of thailand by by one year in terms of family planning but we did not uh, no, sustain it thailand sustained it thailand is only 70 million now huh? Yeah. 70 million, 68 million net or 70 million. Tayo 110 million. So it makes a lot of difference. And yeah, we have more, more mouths to feed. We have more yeah, mouths of course. Feed, more graduates to fill in for yeah. jobs that we don't yeah. have, etc. And the problem also is uh, too, too, too many, uh, too many uh, you know, this large population, many of them are born um, uh, from poor families. Mga right. teenage pregnancies ngayon, right. which results in stunting. 
stunted children. Stunted growth, yes, yes. yes. I, so I, I, talagang ano, it's uh, we our, our uh, we really I think. And I will uh, add one more. You know, these areas of informal settlers were also the petri dishes for a pandemic. All oh, you have to do is introduce one virus and everybody gets contaminated. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. that's right. Sir, but there's another thing that was happening prior to the entry of the pandemic. We were struggling with another uh, epidemic and it was the African swine fever. Yeah. We had ASF that was uh, decimating our hog and farming industry which affected our food security. And today, we're paying the high price of uh, very expensive pork in our uh, markets. Yes. So we're like, we're like a double whammy. What can you say about this? Yeah, I, I, I don't know why it took so long for them, uh, for you know, our authorities to, you know, to address the African swine, African swine fever. That started long before the, no, the long pandemic. before the pandemic. Correct. So before, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, you know, I, I uh, you know, well, there are just too many uh, puzzles that uh, that we have to sort out. Why we are in this? Why we are where we are? Uh, yeah, it, it's been a very very interesting discussion. You've educated me. You're truly a professor emeritus. You've educated <laughs> me about economics yeah. as a health person. And I'd like to hear from you what you would suggest in terms of, uh, for example, there's a new president, a new administration in May, in this coming June. What would you advise this particular uh, incoming administration, whether it's still a Duterte administration or some other one? Yeah. What would you advise them in terms of what to plan, what to do with the second surge? We're still raging with the second surge. What would you do? What are the things you would invest in and... Uh, what were you? What will be your recommendations to the incoming leaders of this country? Uh, I, I would I would strongly suggest that we really invest more in our health system capacity. Kulang talaga, and we should we have to be fair to our healthcare workers. Our healthcare workers are really lagging behind our Asian neighbors. So I mean, we are being unfair. That's why we cannot blame them. They have to go to. They have to go overseas for greener pastures to feed their families. So why can't we do that? We were able to, to uh, raise the salaries of the military mm -hmm. and, also, uh, and also teachers. Mm -hmm. But how about healthcare workers? These are very, these are vital. These are vital cogs in our system. Healthcare workers. And we're yeah. losing them, them with the brain drain. Uh, yeah, and, it, and the, uh, to, pre, to minimize the brain drain. And then, as I've said, the health system capacity, we have, to have, we have to have more hospitals, not only in Metro Manila, but also in the provinces. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and also hospitals that are well provided for, not only with human capital, uh, healthcare workers, but also with equipment and other materials needed for uh, health for, for healthcare. So that's that's very important. Uh, so this has been something neglected, eh? you know, health system capacity. Uh, secondly, I think we really have to modernize our testing, tracing, uh, isolation, and then treatment. I mean, you know, we, we just need, we just, it's not a rocket science. We just, uh, you know, we just follow what the other Asian countries have done in terms of uh, more modern approach to testing, tracing, and so on. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, I think uh, the next administration or whoever, you know, comes uh, next, kailangan talagang anticipatory and foresight planning. Anticipatory and foresight planning. Plus, sense of urgency. Importante talaga ang sense of urgency. Hindi pwede kasing bukas na, uh, saka na yon, ganon. Para yun ang ano natin, eh. that, that, is, that has been our ethos, eh. yung ano, lack of sense of urgency. And that is what I call in my, in, in the, 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 the title of my book is Virtuous Impatience. Virtuous Impatience is the other name of a sense of urgency. So ito lang naman, I mean, there's, the, the, the things we have to do is not, as I've said, not really uh, rocket science or uh, going to the moon or going to Mars. Ganon. It's, uh, it's done. You know, it's done. It's, it's a very common. 
These are very common practices in other countries. So why can't we do it? Uh, Filipinos are bright people too. Uh, so nakakahiya naman na we are lagging behind uh, these uh, other countries for many things that are common sense. Yun, yun ang, yun, that is my, 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 my you know. Uh, and, you know, uh, I don't know how this uh, second wave uh, is going to uh, play out, but I hope it doesn't, uh, you know, stay long. And uh, we really have to, yeah. And we, we, have, we have too many, too many lessons to learn already from last year. Why can't we you know, apply the lessons we have learned from last year to the current uh, wave that is uh, raging uh, in our country? Thank you, Secretary Pernia, Professor Pernia. You've given us a lot of information. This deserves another episode. I think we will get you back sometime soon. Now, we need to talk about this uh, in terms of how health and development are truly married to each other, as a quote from uh, Secretary Pernia and also the importance of sense of urgency or virtues in patients. Yeah. That, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank our guest for today, uh, Professor Ernesto Pernia, for giving all his wisdom, insights, what I call droplets of wisdom, to the, to the economics and the health issues of today. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us here in Health Issues. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Ted. Uh, Dr. Ted, EVP of uh, UP system, of the UP system. Thank you, sir.